Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Today we're doing some exploring of ideas. We're going to take three concepts and dive deep into what we think they mean, how they apply to our lives, and how we hope to see them change things in the future. Let's get started. Listeners, today we're doing some exploring of ideas and concepts. We're kind of being like philosophers. Like we are going to delve deep into some concepts and who knows where it's going to go. But longtime listeners, you know that we get a lot of our ideas from Real Simple Magazine. And one of the series that they have had in the past, and I'm not sure they might still be running it, was My Simple Realization. And I love these little essays. They're kind of like little quotes that make you think. And then they also tell a little story about the quote. So we're going to dive right into that today because we have so much to say. And we definitely want listeners to contribute. So if we're talking about something and you get an idea, feel free to chime in. We'll tell you how to contact us at the end of the episode. But Julia Mindy, when you received these essays from me, one, had you ever seen the My Simple Realization series? And two, do you like these kinds of essays? I had not. I don't take that magazine and I have only seen what you've sent me in the past. Okay. (laughs) So I've not read these, but I do like reading those kind of things. They're short, but they they usually resonate in some way with um with a lot of people, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. I agree. I have not seen it before, but I felt like they're light enough, yet it's kind of food for thought. You know, like it's not smacking you in the face, but you kind of walk away. It's lingering in your mind. Mm-hmm. The first one we want to talk about, listeners, is the quote is, it's better to be happy for a little while than unhappy forever. And basically, it is a little story about a couple that lived in Florida. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it. When my husband and I first moved to the Florida Keys, we intended to spend only the winter months there. The rest of the year, we would travel to Europe and go to shows in New York City. Or so we thought. Instead, they fell in love with this little cat that was hanging around their house. And they ended up staying around their house for the next 10 years for this little cat. Basically, in the story, (laughs) a little rescue that showed up outside their door because they loved it. Then... She passed away and they were heartbroken and they thought, well, at least we'll be able to travel now. So we booked trips everywhere, staying for months in Paris, Denmark, Manhattan. And though we had a lot of fun, without a warm, affectionate cat to return to, the house in Key West seemed empty and cold and we both felt a little rudderless in our lives and even a little depressed. And so, of course, a friend showed them another rescue, similar to their one that had passed away. But they thought, ugh. She's adorable, but we don't want to risk breaking our hearts over another pet that might die soon. And then one day while I was getting my highlights done, my hairstylist asked, isn't it better to be happy for a little while than unhappy forever? It was a total light bulb moment. We had been so happy with Jem, which was their first cat, and we were so unhappy without her. Wouldn't even a few more happy days be worth it? So they raced to the SPCA to rescue their new cat, and with a little veterinary care and lots of good food and love, she is still with them five years later. (laughs) So, of course, that's a cute, heartwarming story, but it's more than about the cat. (laughs) There's a lot packed in there. There (laughs) is. So tell me what you guys thought about when you read that essay. Well, I mean, basically, let's break it down. They're weighing the joy that something brings versus the sorrow of losing it. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I feel like that's right where I'm living right now. Mm. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think in an attempt to be happy, which I think they could classify happy as maybe never failing at something, never losing anything, having no losses. I mean, it's true that you'd miss out on some pain in life, but you'd also miss out on a ton of joy. And I think I'm learning that joy and sorrow coexist. Like it's not an either or Mm -hmm. like we really only understand joy and sorrow because we know them both, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just have to quote C.S. Lewis here because, you know, when he married his wife, joy, 
she died shortly after that. And he says, you know, grief is as deep as your love. Like the extent of the pain you have now is a reflection on how great things were, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, they go hand in hand and, you know, like pain does fade, but joy can last forever. And so I think you don't want to miss out on things for fear of losing them. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mindy? What did you feel like when you read that? Well, I thought of um, seasons, not only with weather, but in life and how when a new season comes, you're saying goodbye to the old season, which again is the joy of sorrow together. To get something new, you have to let something go a lot of times. In our family, I immediately thought of all of our different moves and the communities and the churches and the people that we have opened ourselves up to. And there were places that we lived that I kept up walls because I knew we wouldn't be there long and we were unhappy. We were, I would call it safe, but we were unhappy. And so I realized looking back, even the places that we did open ourselves up, we did let people in, we learned to love new people and we became part of church families and we served and it was our lives and it was really painful to leave. It was really hard to leave. At the same time, we were much happier in those places. Mm -hmm. Did either of you reflect on whether you live this way or whether it's uncomfortable for you to live? Like, did any, did either of you reflect on whether you live this way? Well, I, I definitely think it's easier to love secure things. I think it's a self-protective thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you said, Mindy, when you open yourself up, that the hurt is going to even be greater if you lose it. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's easier to love secure things. But then I thought, what really is secure? (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing is really, um, Mm -hmm. we might as well let loose and (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think there's certain things like I know when we moved here again for just our family, I had to make a decision and I know my kids did as well. And I saw them making it of, all right, this is going to be home. We are going to put down roots. We are going to open ourselves up. We are going to let people in and we're going to give of ourselves so that we can make this place home. Because I do know that a couple of my children in previous places, I saw them protecting themselves and not opening up and not making a lot of friends because they didn't want to. They're like, we're just going to leave. What's the point? And so um, in this season of life, each of my family members have chosen to open, to learn to love, to learn to let new people in. Um, but I think there's other things that, you know, I still kind of like, I'm like, no, I'm not willing to do that. And I think it just mm, depends on mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. So something as simple or as difficult as adopting a pet, you know, mm. like even from the article, I thought about mm-hmm. that. I'm like, I'm just not, not because of the pain of losing it, but the pain of owning it. But I mean, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, I asked several women and some men to comment on this. Like I sent them the text and I sent them the article and I just wanted to get a variety. And somebody wrote back something that is similar to what you just said, Mindy, where you said that your family members just had to make the choice kind of to be happy. And um, this person wrote, for most people, happiness doesn't just happen. You have to realize what makes you happy, nurture it, be flexible, make adjustments to your life, be willing to work for it. She said, I have seen so many just not realize they have some control over what happens. The word happiness is very close to the word happens. That means what happens to us and what we can make happen. We have to decide. And I think in that situation, you aren't just waiting for happiness to fall into your lap. You're saying, well, what can I do to be happy here? What's my part? You know, right. Um, I thought that was interesting. I also thought it was interesting that several people sent me songs. This made them think of different songs. I'll get to those in a second. But this was a text thread between a couple people. And the person said, I think it's basically like saying it's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. (laughs) She just picked the word happy. And the other person said, I don't think it's better to be happy for a little while than unhappy forever. I just take no emotion over being unhappy forever, which I thought was quite the interesting statement. They would rather just feel nothing 
than risk being unhappy. But then they followed it up with this song. Lady A says, I'd rather hurt than feel nothing at all. So they said, you know, but there's this there's these songs out there that say just the opposite. Like, I I do think that we're told by society all the time. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. But it's not as easy for some people to do that as you might think. (laughs) It's it's not because anytime you open yourself up to any other living thing, you're going to be hurt. Mm hmm. Yeah. Like it just it you will. Right. And so it's hard. Yeah. And I think as parents, you really know what this means, because there's a cost to love and happiness. There's the opposite, mm-hmm. you know, pain. And I think as parents, you know, firsthand that because like you have all this joy having this child, but if the child is hurt or rejected, mm-hmm. you feel that, mm-hmm. you know. And right. there's just there's just no way around that. Like, but so that's just a great example of how they go hand in hand, the joy and the sorrow. They just mm-hmm. they coexist. They have to. Does anyone know the Garth Brooks song, um, The Dance? I mean, mm-hmm. a, a famous line is I could have missed the pain, but I would have had to miss the dance. Someone sent mm-hmm. me that, which <laughs> is true. <laughs> Someone else sent me a song that I had not heard before by Johnny Swim called Devastating. And she pointed out these lyrics, I want to love you till it's devastating, meaning until, you know, the very end when I lose you. Mm -hmm. And then another lyric from that is, you know, it's good when the ending's tragic. And it's kind of like, he's making a bad face, but it's kind of like, you know, it was good. Like you said, Julie, your pain is a reflection of how much joy you had. Yeah, the hurt is a sign of how much love there was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess this article just really challenged me to think about ways that I could live like this more because I don't know if I would agree the person that said um, I'd rather experience no emotion than be (laughs) unhappy. (laughs) But I do tend to safeguard my emotions and maybe I only want to give them to pretty secure in quotes things. I know that there's nothing that is totally secure. But Mm -hmm. I think this doesn't have to be only with people. I was thinking about like careers that people choose. Um, I was thinking about somebody, you know, that maybe had a really safe job, but they decide I'm not happy at this job. And I'd rather be happy for a little while at this other job and maybe not have it later or something. You know, I don't know. Could you think of other examples where it wasn't really people, but it still was a big lifestyle change? Yeah, I mean, I said you could extend this line of thinking even just to getting out of your comfort zone, putting yourself out there, trying something new, going back to school. I mean, it, it could apply to a lot of the anything's anything that you're taking a risk mm-hmm. um, where you where you could be hurt or um, rejected or fail. Yeah, Julie, mm-hmm. that brings to mind the woman that we had on. She was a friend of yours that we interviewed and. She went to she went back to school and it was a lot harder than she thought. I think she was pretty miserable at the time. Then I don't even think she got a job in the field afterwards. So it was still kind of a nightmare. Yeah, this is definitely we should link to her story because it's mm, it's wonderful. I can, I can link to that in the show. notes. OK, um, so her testimony is fabulous. And this is something that our family has 100 percent experienced. This is the direction of. Bryce in my marriage. This is direction of the last 25 years together. We did sacrifice for him to go back to school um, after we had Abby and Grant. And so um, that was a season of life. The two years that we hardly saw him for working, for going to school full time. And that was in an effort to be happy later. We knew we were going to be unhappy for two years. Mm. We knew we would hardly see him for two years. And we also knew that we were going to accumulate some debt over two years, but it was worth, we felt like it was worth the investment in his education to go someplace because he was so unhappy in his um, job before that, that he Mm -hmm. wanted to actually change careers just like a couple of years after graduating with his bachelor's. And so this was an effort to give him a lot of years in a career that he loved. He's like, if I'm going to go to work all day, every day, I want to enjoy what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And right now I don't, I'm going to need more education to get to that point. And so that happened. 
And um, and then we continued to choose his career over being stable in one place. We could have stayed in one place several times and been there a lot longer. Um, but we chose, and I wouldn't say it was a monetary thing. I would say it was the adventure. Mm. We wanted a life of adventure. We wanted a life of interacting um, in the world and different cultures and different parts of the United States, different peoples. Um, and so this is something that each of our kids has experienced. So they, they have been exposed to different cultures and peoples and parts of the country, and they can talk to anyone because of it, but it's come with a trade-off. Mm-hmm. We haven't lived in the same house where we have notches on the door frame of how tall they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, they Mm -hmm. haven't grown up with friends down the road that they've known forever and ever. And so sometimes I feel like we've missed some things at the same time. Again, it's a trade-off. Yeah. We have chosen a different way of life. Well, I was going to say, I think going back to school, I think maybe we're flipping the quote Mm -hmm. with this one. We're saying it's better to be unhappy for a little while than unhappy forever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's what we did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but this quote is, it's better to be happy for a little while than unhappy forever. But my brother was telling me about somebody who made a career choice at his school that I thought kind of was that they were willing to take a job that only has federal funds for five years because they thought the job would be so enjoyable, even though at the end of five years, they might be unhappy that they forego getting their foot in somewhere else, establishing seniority, their job might completely disappear. But they're like, now nah, take the five years on the front end. I don't know if mm-hmm. I always live like that. Do you guys live like that? No, because it's risky. <laughs> yeah. The older I get, the less risk I'm willing to take. Now, see, I was thinking that maybe the older you got, or like maybe with Mindy after moving several times, that some things might get easier because you've seen both sides now. Like, you do survive, uh, hurts heal, and you grow and mature and you learn things from those things. So that's also another way to look at it is right. once you see this isn't going to kill me, mm, <laughs> you right. might be willing to risk more next time. Mm-hmm. We do have a lot of survival instincts. and, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and but, um, but I will say that like the older Bryce and I get, the, the less risk we're willing to take. And we want to adventure, but we want to come back home to the same home. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're, we're definitely slowing down in that life of adventure. But one aspect I wanted to bring up to you guys, something that I feel like I have been so curious about. I know so many families have lovingly gone down this road is foster care. I was thinking about foster oh, care. Oh man, I just I feel like you're signing up to be hurt. Yeah. And it breaks my heart to think about going down that road um because you're I mean, you're trying to be a mom and we already know there's pain associated with that, but like this is this is even more hurt because you have like no control over how long or, you know, what that child has been through. And I just cannot imagine that. Mm-hmm. But that's that's like the life of this quote to me is foster care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think of all the people that are willing to do ministries and service for people where the end road is often pain for them, you know, or <laughs> sadness. And I think like so many times people are like, choose to do things that make you happy and some jobs or callings or ministries they might fulfill you you might feel like you are doing what god told you to do you might be doing what is put into your lap at the time and you might even enjoy it while you're doing it but then you know you're going to feel bad julie you're nodding your head well they don't always have big worldly payoffs. You know what I mean? Right. Maybe not a lot of recognition or even financial reward sometimes, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. I know people in ministry suffer a lot sometimes. They do. Like Bryce has come home talking about um, certain nurses or medical professionals that are called specifically to hospice. Mm. They are called to be there at the end of life. And I, you know, Going into it, that's you're dealing with 
mm-hmm. that with losing that patient. And I just, it, it's, it is a calling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this all makes me think of that book. Um, I mentioned it, I think in our summer episode of what we were reading is called, what if it's wonderful? Oh, um, just because so many times I think the things we fear or worry about don't happen or they're not as bad mm-hmm. as we thought they were, or mm-hmm. they are, but mm-hmm. God, God is there, you know? Right. And uh, she talks a lot about celebrating in the midst of sorrow. And that's, that's kind of where I am. Like I look and think, how can I be happy? Or if I am happy, I think this is, this feels so wrong, mm. you know, to be happy because look mm-hmm. at this, mm-hmm. look what could happen. But what if it didn't happen? Or mm-hmm. <laughs> what if something happened to me first mm-hmm. and I never had to, you know, that would be a shame to have wasted the time we have right now to be happy. Mm. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know what's going to happen to either one of us, really. And right. I, I just try to keep that in mind. Like, now is the time to be happy, not later, mm. not to plan on it being to be later. Um, Cause you don't know. And you don't, you don't want to have any regrets. Right. Right. I don't know if you feel this way, Mindy, Julie, I know that you would say, quit feeling that way, but I can't help it. I thought of this when I read this article. Um, I was trying to think of times when I like, when I may have done something that makes me happy for a time, knowing that it might make me unhappy later. And I was thinking about being a stay-at-home mom. And I'm talking about being a stay-at-home mom after your kids have gone to school, because everybody says you're going to regret it. If they don't say it to your face, they say it through media outlets, they say it through, you know, I don't know. I just feel like so many people imply and scare me over the years in that I'm going to regret it. You're going to regret not keeping up with your career. You're going to regret being alone when your kids leave. You're going to be sad. You're going to be devastated. Basically, I'm going to be hobbled up in a hole in a fetal position when my kids leave. This is how I feel. But my other choice is to go back to work while I'm still happy staying at home. And I'm still happy doing what I'm doing. So I feel like I've chosen to be happy in the present, knowing that I might be completely a basket case at the end. And I don't know, do you, can you relate to that at all, Mindy? I absolutely 100% can. In um, in another aspect of it, of looking at it, that I did not ever finish my education. I was married young, Bryce and I, I was 18, he was 20. Um, and that has been something that um, has been talked about with me or pushed on me and also thoughts that I've had myself is, well, if something happens to Bryce, I'm not going to be able to, you know, keep up with our lifestyle or take care of the children or pay off the house or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that's constantly been, you know, while I stay at home and I'm like, Ooh, should I, you know, should I go and finish school now? Like, well, what do I want to do? I'm different person now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, um, that has not been a popular opinion. However, it's my opinion and I've gotten more comfortable with it because like you, Marie, I'm like, well, I'm happy now. Why would I become unhappy in my happiness Mm -hmm. because of the unknown? (laughs) Right. You know? And so Bryce is like, look, Mindy, there's plenty of life insurance. We've planned for it. If something happens to me, you can go to school then. Like you'll be really unhappy. (laughs) (laughs) You might as well be unhappy about a lot of things at once. Grieving when I was in school. <laughs> I, I say I I shouldn't laugh about that, but I mean that that is that is exactly the conversations that we have had. It's like yeah, we all my whole family is functioning very well. Why would I rock the boat? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's easy to say to play. You know what do they call it? Monday quarterback. What do they call that? What's that word? Monday morning, Monday morning quarterback. quarterback. Yeah. Like oh yeah, uh-huh. sure. Like. But you were happy doing that. So you can't, you know, mm-hmm. you can't say, oh, I would have given all that up. Like, just because now you want something different. It's like oh saying, God. oh, I shouldn't have gone to medical school because someday I'll retire. Like, well, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Right. think of all the years of happiness that were in there, you know. Right. Fulfillment. Yeah. This uh, article brought a lot of things to mind. And Listeners, I hope it's made you think a little bit too. I am going to try to remember it the next time I'm making some kind of decision. You know, I don't know. It stretched me a little bit to read this one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So that was the first um, idea that we were going to talk about today. 
The next idea is also something where we should be stretching ourselves. The quote for this one is called, boredom is what my brain needed. And boy, I don't even want to read that essay because I'm like, don't tell me that. Uh Uh-uh, not listening, not listening. But I already know that it's going to be convicting right from the beginning. But basically, this woman notices that she can't do anything without something in her ears. How can she exercise without listening to something? She noticed how she'd been pairing her routines with something to listen to, always with the intent of making the task more pleasurable. Before I got out of the shower, I turned on a podcast, vacuuming or folding laundry, perfect time for an audiobook. I couldn't even brush my teeth before bed without someone chattering in my ear. The COVID outbreak made things worse. Given the 24-7 togetherness with the family, I discovered shamefully that I could be alone by popping in my earbuds. So anyways, I don't know if you guys can relate to those sentiments, but she decided that this is probably not healthy. Like, I should probably make some changes. So she did. She decided to take her dogs for a walk without her ear pods. And she said she did notice the birds chirping and the sun filtering through the trees, but mostly she was just bored. And by the time she circled back, she felt calmer and clearer as though the fog had lifted and her thoughts had evaporated. She could actually hear herself think. Maybe boredom was what my brain needed. And I thought, you know, so many times that probably is what my brain needed. She kind of closes out saying, a fact of modern life is that having a fire hose of entertainment at our fingertips means it's all too easy to distract ourselves right out of our own minds. And even if it's a little dull, it's a moment of stillness, a chance to be alone with our thoughts, and maybe it's the only one we'll get all day. So were you guys as convicted by this as I was when you read it? Well, I... I do go through phases where I feel like I have too much input. Like I loved her phrase, drinking from the fire hose of entertainment, Mm -hmm. you know, because I do like to try to listen to books and I love podcasts and I love news podcasts and um, I love listening to Bible apps and sermons, you know, but if I find myself kind of restless and antsy and fretful, I know it's because there's been too much input. Mm. Like, there could be too much of a good thing, too much learning, taking in new information. And if if I never process it and figure out, well, what am I going to do with this? Mm-hmm. How am I going to apply it or let it shape my thinking? Then it's really just noise. And so I just, I don't have a hard time turning it off. I'll realize sometimes I'm in the car and I'm already at my destination and nothing was on. Hmm. You know, no, mm-hmm. no radio, no nothing. Um, I can, I can easily take walks without any listening to anything just because mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't, I don't call it boredom though. I don't know what, mm-hmm. I don't know what just quiet peace, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. you know, that's, that's what I was going to say, Julie, um, is that it was several years ago that I realized that I was afraid of silence. I was afraid of nothing mm. of, you know, no noise. It was a practice that I, that I started to try to be okay with silence. Mm. Um, then I realized that the more silence I allowed myself, the more my mind could wander, the more creative I was, the more things came to mind. I couldn't believe how many thoughts Mm. (laughs) that generated, Mm -hmm. but I, it needed space Mm -hmm. because I had more thoughts generating from silence than thoughts generating from some sort of input from Mm -hmm. something else because Mm -hmm. I could allow myself to follow the squirrel wherever Mm -hmm. it wanted to go. And a lot of times it was going great places that I just didn't give myself time Mm -hmm. to go before. And so some of my most creative days or the days that I'm most productive are the days that are most silent. And um, I call them silent days now. Um, Mm -hmm. There are certain times where there has been a lot of stimulus or we've had people or activity or whatever it is. And I know I need to come home and I just need to not have any noise. And I'm very productive and it's the most restful, peaceful, energizing, best recovery are silent days. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. It can be kind of a learning curve to be comfortable in your own thoughts. And (laughs) Mm -hmm. you you think about people that sing in the shower or get great ideas. That's kind of a funny, Mm -hmm. you know, a scenario to think about getting great ideas into the shower. But if you've got a podcast going in the shower, that is not going to happen. 
<laughs> you're you you're always hearing other people's ideas. Right. You're never generating any of your own. Yeah, talking to yourself, bouncing those ideas back and mm-hmm. forth. Yeah. I guess it was convicting for me because I really did used to walk with nothing. I would go out for a walk by myself and not bring anything. Like I didn't even have anything. And then I discovered podcasts. And all of a sudden, it was so much more fun to go for a walk. And the walk went by so much more quickly. And then I discovered wireless earbuds. And I could move around my kitchen with do my dishes, like everything. I painted whole rooms. And it was a total pleasure because it was a way to listen to this podcast. Like, I don't know. I felt like I kind of got used to listening to things. That's one thing. I love to listen to podcasts in the kitchen over the loudspeaker Mm. because it drives me nuts. My son walks around with his headphones on all the time and I'm just talking away and he hasn't heard a word I said. And, you know, (laughs) That drives me nuts that you have to interrupt. So I'd rather mm-hmm. everybody know mom is listening to this. Yes. I know, but, but then, then everybody still... makes fun of it. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Maybe they'll learn something. <laughs> I feel like anytime I put my AirPods in, it's it I'm telling everybody else no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um and so Julie, I'm similar to you. I'm on the receiving end. Pretty much all the time. Bryce and the boys um, love listening through their earbuds. And I'm the one that's not. And so I've had to get comfortable saying, hey, I'm trying to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And I don't yeah, like you're waving. enjoy having to do that. Um, but I just, you know, I'm just kind of like, all right, I'll choose my battles. Okay, so um, <laughs> my house is not the only one then where the people no. are walking around with AirPods, AirPods in their mouth, in their mouth, not in their mouth, in their ears. Right. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I and I feel like I'm being rude if I put AirPods in in my house when people are home, because I feel like I'm telling them no. Yeah, like I'm not available for you. But your other family members don't feel that way. They don't. They're not convicted. (laughs) Not one bit. I I am, though. I know. I feel guilty, too. (laughs) I feel guilty, too. Yet everybody else could walk around with whatever they want in their ears 24 (laughs) 7. I know it, it is. It is a odd thing. I don't enjoy it because I feel like I'm closed off to the world in a way. Like I don't know. Like I've put blinders on when I have. I don't, so mm-hmm. um, I will listen to most of my stuff out loud. I um, and then you clear the I, room because they're like, I can't listen to my AirPods and what I, she's listening to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, my AirPods only come out every once in a while. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting essay. Think about it, listeners. Boredom or just silence really might be what your brain needs. And I do think that I used to sit in silence a lot more before. I I think like the more you put in your mind, it's almost like the more you feel like you want to put in your mind. And there's a never ending amount. Like we're not going to be able to put it all in there. I think I'm turned off by the word boredom, too. I've always hated that word. Like when a kid says I'm bored. Like, it's okay, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's okay to sit in silence. It's okay to be creative and have to think up something and, you know. Uh. Right. All right. Well, our third essay is about a quote that says, a good quit feels powerful. And I just knew when I read this that Julie would love this. <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> Okay. So basically, it is about somebody who's saying it's okay to quit things. Pretty much that is the summary. Um, Maybe the trick isn't sticking everything out. The trick is quitting the right thing at the right time. The trick is understanding that saying no thank you to something you're expected to accept isn't failure. It's a whole other level of success. All right, Julie, what about this appeals to you? Well, I have a hard time quitting things. Mm-hmm. And there's always this yucky, vague sense of guilt when I quit things. And I don't even know where that, that's what I wanted to figure out is where is that coming from? Because even as a kid, if my parents kind of gave me a way out, you know, like you don't have to do this, I still had a hard time quitting. Mm. And that's why I took piano for 12 years. And <laughs> <laughs> that's why. I wanted to play the piano, the flute, soccer, tennis, volleyball, track, swimming, you know, mm-hmm. like I, and I don't know if that was maybe fear of missing out 
I just wanted to be involved. I don't know. I think it's like perseverance is a virtue, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's a good thing. We're taught that's a good thing. Don't quit. Mm -hmm. And but I started thinking about like as I got older, like I wanted to go to medical school from the time I was a freshman in high school. Like Mm -hmm. I had an awesome teacher, Miss Watson. Mm -hmm. She just opened up all these doors and thoughts about medical school. And then I had that until my sophomore year of college. And I quit that idea of going to medical school. Mm. And it was a really, really hard decision. But I knew it was right. But it was hard because you felt like you were so invested in it. You Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. like everybody knows this. I've told everybody this. Like, what are they going to think? And Mm -hmm. I loved what um, I don't know if she said this in the article or if I read this somewhere else. Like, but quitting is okay if your goals have changed. Mm. Or continuing it doesn't align with what you now value. And what I then started to value was I knew I wanted a family over Mm. a career. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't need to hang on to that. It was okay to let that go. But that was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to quit. Mm. Mm -hmm. And and some of it was other people's uh, thinking of it, but it it was really just hard for for me to let it go. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Yeah, I don't know. It, that was that is a that's hard one. My mind I didn't even know mm-hmm. that you did that. Yeah, I changed to pharmacy school because I thought that's a career I could do. You mm-hmm. know, I could you could be in and out of mm-hmm. with a right. family. So right, yeah, yeah. I don't know why we do feel so ashamed of quitting. Do you feel shame around quitting, Mindy? Yes, I, ironically, um, before we even knew we were doing this topic, I and I had a discussion in the past week about there are certain things that we have each kind of thought about that we've been afraid to tell each other because we would be afraid to let each other down if we don't pursue it. Mm. And so Mm -hmm. that, that was the topic of our conversation. Like I, in my silence, Mm -hmm. um, I have, I have had some creative thoughts and I just am too afraid to tell anybody. I was even afraid to tell Bryce because if I changed my mind, if my goals changed, if it became not important, you know, Mm -hmm. and I didn't pursue it, I did not want him to see me as a quitter. And Mm -hmm. he, he had some things he was like, that's why I was afraid to tell you about this. And like, you know, I've been thinking about this and we just had a really great conversation where we both pretty much said like, these are things we've thought about, but I've been afraid to like say it out loud Mm. because, because Mm -hmm. of this, the pressure. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There is so much pressure around quitting. This is kind of tongue in cheek, but is it better to have tried and quit than (laughs) never to have tried at all? Is it? No, you didn't. (laughs) (laughs) But it's a real question. Like, is it, is it better to have at least tried it and quit? (laughs) you develop a pattern i mean <laughs> you don't know I how to sex this fear pattern. maybe if you try too many things and quit yeah. them if you're gonna you're afraid that you'll quit everything i don't know yeah, that's yeah. I, that's where my mind went well i know as an adult more recently a more recent example is something that i tried to love that i've quit over and over again and i'm just gonna tell you right now what I'm is not it? doing this cookies is knitting Knitting? Oh. oh, but I've I've seen you knit so many times over no. the years. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. I have. Oh. <laughs> I have friends that love to knit. There's even mm. a knitting group, a multi generational, wonderful knitting group. It sounds like a wonderful skill to have, especially as you get older. And maybe you can't do other things. <laughs> but I just have tried to like it. I've made a few things. I don't feel like I'm very good at it. I every time I pick it up, it's like inventing reinventing the wheel I don't know what I'm doing (laughs) and I'm just I'm just not gonna do it anymore yeah Yeah. (laughs) I learned to knit but I gave myself permission to quit after a certain thing I only make small square (laughs) dishcloths that's all I make I gave myself permission to learn it and I gave myself permission to go no farther after I learned this one thing Mm, good for you (laughs) but yeah because if I start trying to do sweaters and I end up with like mismatched sleeves or three sleeves like I'm gonna feel like a real loser and I'll end up quitting the whole thing all together 
<laughs> I know our friend Judy made socks. I was like, okay, there is no way I'll ever make a sock. And if I did, I'd probably only make one because I'd never, I'd never make the, the other one. No, there are conversations that I have with myself in my head that are like, Mindy, you just don't care enough about that. Let it go. Like right. it doesn't mm-hmm. define you. It doesn't make you a better person. It's okay mm-hmm. that you're not good at that. You're good at these other things here. Let's remind yourself what you're good at, because then I could feel a little better about myself for not being good at the other things that I've tried. (laughs) I just feel so bad, you guys. I just feel like I feel like you, Mindy, that when I try something, I don't even want to tell anybody. It's not even that I'm thinking about trying. It's like I've actually tried it, trying it, but I don't want to tell anyone anymore because they're going to bring it up. Like, Julie, Mm -hmm. I know you love your ESL. Well, based on your recommendation, I signed up for ESL one year. I did not enjoy ESL. I didn't enjoy it. I I may have enjoyed a different type of teaching, but um, I quit. It, this was like four years ago. I had someone in my family the other day ask me, if, if I, how's my ESL going? It's like, okay, another thing that Marie tried and quit. Let oh. me just... I have tried homeschooling two different times. I am a terrible teacher of other people. I have zero patience. I know one way to say it. If you don't get it after that, I'm done. Like, I don't like teaching. And yet, you know, I mean, I I feel shameful, though. I'm now telling on the podcast, but I feel ashamed that I tried homeschooling. I love the concept so much. I want those pictures, those idyllic pictures. But I couldn't make them happen to save my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but Marie, only, you've been podcasting mm-hmm. for almost five years now. Only Woo-hoo. because you've dragged me along, mm-hmm. Julie. <laughs> Listen, that this is one of the things, a bright spot in my life. I'm like, I haven't quit the podcast. I've been married for 25 years. Okay. Okay. I haven't dropped off any children any place and left them. So that's yeah. a testimony. But um, <laughs> marriage, 34 years. <laughs> but homeschooling, I was like, I totally, you and I are on the same wavelength with the homeschooling. I think that's what solidified our relationship actually back in Nashville. <laughs> like that was the only season of my life. I cried every single night. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's either mom's health or homeschooling. I okay. Know. They're going back to school. <laughs> Grant said the other day, I remember my teacher asking me one month after I left school, why I was back so soon. <laughs> <laughs> isn't it embarrassing mindy it's such a public humiliation oh yeah the teacher's asking <laughs> it's grant <just> remembers ter- <laughs> it's awful. terrible but i will say the only the only way i think i was able to be successful like with my health journey in the mm-hmm. past mm-hmm. was i had to i was very tight-lipped i didn't say a word to anybody i mm. couldn't talk about it because mm-hmm. i was i was already afraid i was gonna let myself down i could not be um, keeping other people get, you know, keeping tabs with other people. Yeah. Um, That's it, interesting. It, Cause so many people mm-hmm. say, Oh, accountability helps them. Mm-hmm. But- well, there's different types of accountability. Um, there really are. And so I'm not going to put this big pl- proclamation out there. I'm starting a health journey for the next 75 days. I'm going <laughs> to only do this. I'm like, dude, you just sealed your fate. Like I'm dead already before I've even started. Um, I would tell you when I was done with 75 days, yeah. And I, I would encourage you along, but I can't, you know, now the outward accountability I need is just meeting people at the gym, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, but I, I can't, yeah, I can't <laughs> proclaim something. Right. Cause I won't do it. Marie, I remember <laughs> I said, I talked up uh, wanting to learn to weave. <laughs> oh, and yes. I remember Marie asking me several times, have you ever done anything with that? <laughs> Oh no. And then she, I think she even found me a class. She was like, there's a class at the at the library. <gasps> no. Marie's like, come on, Julie, you need to follow through. I'll reach reach your goals. <laughs> Actually, I think that's what inspired me to finally weave something though. So I've I've woven one thing. I think you thing. did weave one thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh Marie's gonna ask me. I uh, think the problem is that we call so many things quitting when maybe they've just come to their natural end. Like I did oil painting for a few years and I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. It was a decision that can be a natural ending point. I am getting a little bored with my same exercise routine. It's been like a year and 
four or five months. And I'm thinking in Mm -hmm. a couple months, I might move, try some other things. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. know that that should be perceived as quitting my boot camp. It should be perceived as that was good. And now I need something fresh or my mind Mm -hmm. can't make myself do it anymore. Yeah, no, I think quitting would be if you just quit all exercise and sat around and didn't do anything. That would be right. But changing up, I mean, I don't think we have to be like nailing everything we do. You can choose what you get to do and how Mm -hmm. well you want to do it. Like, Mm -hmm. like I kind of feel guilty every time I see our piano in the taking up all that space in one room. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. like, okay, I took for 12 years. I should be in there practicing, but I don't really want to like, yeah, Yeah. it's okay that I'm not a master at the piano, you know, I can play a few things for myself. I mean, (laughs) yeah, but maybe the focus should be on that. We're learning new things because Mm -hmm. sometimes the fear of quitting may cause you to stay stagnant Mm -hmm. and unhappy. I'll put that out there Mm -hmm. and that we all continue to move forward and grow. And sometimes you have to kind of shake off some things to keep moving forward and growing. And so even like Marie, like I've, I've had probably three different seasons of changing up my exercise routine. Sometimes I'll, you know, I'll go for a year or two with one particular kind of thing. And then I'm like, I'm kind of done with that. I'm ready to learn something new. Right. So maybe we just say that I'm going to learn something new. Good job. <laughs> Learning something new is powerful. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, we are going to move into I'm a fan. All right. Let, tell me what new thing you have for us this week, Mindy. What are you a fan of? I love how you just put that because I'm a huge fan of the seasonal Chick-fil-A peach milkshake. Hey, is it new? (laughs) Yum. It's new every summer. (laughs) (laughs) And I will tell you, I was getting so ready for this milkshake to come back into season. I tried it for the first time last summer. Fell in love. I'm not a milkshake person. I mean, not at all. And I don't know what it was about moving to Georgia, maybe because all the peaches, right. that, you know, everything's peach tree, this and whatever. So, um, yes, on a like a 95 degree day, I decided to try my first one and I was hooked. That so sounds good this, on a 95 degree oh, day. Oh, man. It's, so <laughs> it's actually got like chunks of real peaches in it. Mm-hmm. It is delicious. Okay. So, I have not tried that, but I might oh, have to break down. Oh, Chick-fil-A you, milkshakes are a notch I do about. love their peppermint one. Every mm-hmm. Christmas, I have to get that See, several I times. I still haven't tried that one, Marie. No? Mm-hmm. Okay. I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have fallen in love with the peach milkshake. Mm, mm. Awesome. Well, that is something new, and it's only out for a short time. That's and right. Chick-fil-A is not quitting the milkshake, not the no. peach one. They're going to bring it back. We might bring right. back our quits, too. When I'm talking about <laughs> it's on rotation. <laughs> yes. All right, Julie, what are you a fan of this week? All right. This past weekend, my daughter and little grandson were here, and he's no longer sleeping in a crib, so he's in a in a bed. Mm-hmm. And when he was in his crib, he would actually sleep in the closet. It's a pretty big closet. It even has a window and an air vent. And we would just black out the window, close off the vent, you know. Mm-hmm. But now that he's out in the room, the room is very bright. There's four windows. Mm-hmm. And Molly asked me if there was anything I could do about those windows, like put some blackout fabric over them. So I just envision blackout curtains as black mm. and very ugly. So I just went over to Target and I was thinking, I'll just get one and I'll just thumbtack it up at the window. Mm. Well, I found these adorable curtains. They're from the Pillow Fort line, which is their kids line. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're white or cream colored and they have a little scalloped edge. Mm. So I put those up at the window on curtain rods that I already had. Mm -hmm. And I had posted a picture of the bed sheets I bought him. I bought these little bug insect sheets and everybody kept commenting on the curtains. Where'd you get those curtains? Oh, really? (laughs) I'm going to have to go back and look at that picture. They are so cute. So, um, and they don't look like a kid's room. I mean, okay. Okay. There's no print or anything on them. They're just cream colored with a little scalloped edge and they really do, um, Black out the room, the light. Wow, that's awesome. Blackout curtains have come a long way. I, I have yes. my initial reaction to those too, Julia, is like, Ugh. but they've yeah. come a long way. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you would really never know from the front. So Yeah. Oh, well, good. We'll put a link to those in our show notes. I am a fan this week of something from Aldi. And have you ever been in Aldi where you buy something and the cashier's like, don't you love that? And then Mm. I always know it's going to be a good product because the cashier loves it and she must buy it. So this is is their (laughs) crunchy granola protein. And Mm -hmm. it says uh, 10 grams of protein per serving. Um, It's just a solid granola. I like granola that does not include raisins. I'm only looking for the granola because I'm going to mix in with my yogurt and fruit. Mm. So I would recommend that. It's just in their cereal aisle. There's not a lot you can say about it, except that their crunchy granola protein is really good. And the cashier agrees. She said, don't you just love that? Sometimes I just eat it straight out of the bag. And I was like, great. (laughs) Thank you for that. I was just wanting some more like things to get at Aldi. Okay. Well, good. Well, you can put that on your list. It is made by the brand Millville, which I think might be a lot of Aldi things. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. cereal. Yeah. Yeah. So that sounds yummy. Yeah. All right, listeners, we hope that you've enjoyed our thoughts around these three essays today. We would love to hear your thoughts. Come and find us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast or email us at Midlife Matters Podcast at gmail.com. I love hearing everyone's perspective. So please, if you have a thought on quitting or boredom or loving and losing rather than never loving at all, we want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Julie and Mindy, I loved hearing your thoughts on this. Yes, this this was was fun. fun. Okay, Mm -hmm. we'll talk to you next week. All right, bye. 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 We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast.com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at midlifematterspodcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.